Um, I, I was reading an article. First of all, um, Wadey and, and team, thank you guys so much. Can we give them a round of applause? That was, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. I, I was reading an article, and I'm, I'm still trying to process it this week. Uh, they talked about worship, and it, it said that uh, the majority of people leave a Sunday service, and they remember more of, of what was sung than what was taught. And I, I'm still trying to process what that means, but I, I think it, it, it's, if there's anything from it that I got, it's this, that, that worship really matters. Um, how we worship, what we worship, um, it makes a huge difference. And so um, incredible worship leaders like we have here in Wadeo and Katie uh, are, are an incredible part of our uh, experience uh, on a Wednesday night uh, worshiping God. And so um, huge shout out to them. Um, what they do means a lot to us. And if you're the kind of person like I was in middle school who hated worshiping, um, I want to say this, that, that's okay, uh, but I, I encourage you to continue to engage with it anyway. Um, I, I know this, that, that God accepts uh, even, even our worship to him that uh, we do um, knowing that it's just a, an obligation. And the more we do it, I think that we'll find that the more we'll grow to love it. Um, that's what happened for me anyways, but that's a story for another night. Welcome uh, to Chaska Next. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself, Zach, as I introduce tonight's message on how God introduces himself. It's a, it's a lot of introductions. Um, it all comes from Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 to 7. You'll see it on the screens. If you guys have your Bibles, you can turn there with me tonight, too. We'll be there for just a moment. It says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is how God chooses to introduce himself in Scripture. Compassion, slowness to anger, loyal love. Jada and Jessica talked about the first two, and tonight I looked forward to telling you about the third. But first, let me know if you agree with this statement. People are fickle. People are untrustworthy. People are unstable. If we watch any sports team, you know that it's true. Uh, the team wins one week and the fans are convinced that the team's going to win a championship. But when they lose the next, and the fans think that everyone in the organization should be fired... And it's, it's based off of a simple principle. People like us when we're doing well. And it's because we can offer them something. But when the tide turns and we don't serve a purpose, people are very quick to toss us aside. Now, now, here's the thing. When I was writing this message, um, this happened to me, so I know it's happening to you too. Immediately, you're probably thinking of someone who's done this to you. But let's not be too quick to list names. Let's look at ourselves. Which parent is your favorite? If we're honest, if we're honest, it's probably the one who's given us what we want or who took our side in the last family argument or who brought us DQ when we had that late night craving the other night. See, see people are fickle, which means that we're fickle too. Every single one of us want stability in a relationship. I know that. We want friends who are going to be there in hard times. We want siblings who genuinely care about how our day was. We want parents who treat us fairly, yes. justly. I hear that. But each day we see that these relationships fall short of what we're looking for. And frankly, it's, it's awful. It's really hard. But I do have good news. What you want in a relationship exists. There is a love, there is a loyalty, there is a generosity that goes beyond your greatest hopes and your greatest expectations. And it's found in the person of God. Here is that good news as described by one Henri Nouwen. Here's what he says. You'll see the quote up on the screen. Long before any human being saw us, we are seen by God's loving eyes. Long before anyone heard us cry or laugh, we are heard by our God who is all ears for us. Long before any person spoke to us in this world, we were spoken to by the voice of eternal love. Our preciousness 
uniqueness and individuality are not given to us by those who meet us in clock time or our brief chronological existence, but by the one who has chosen us with an everlasting love, a love that existed from all eternity and will last through all eternity. Tonight, we're going to talk about the loyal love that God has demonstrated, us, demonstrated to us and how he is loyal when we are disloyal, how he is loving when we do not feel lovable, and how he is generous when we are empty. Let's pray. God, on a, a night where we reflect on uh, the gifts that you've given us, um, or the greatest gift that you've given us is you. And so uh, as we hear this, this word tonight, Lord, I pray that you would open our ears to who you are. And Lord, that as we know you more, um, that we would have a desire uh, to uh, continue to learn, to, to continue to be present with you. And so God, guide us in this time. Teach us what you want us to teach us. We pray all this in your name. Amen. There's a pretty fickle individual early in scripture. His name is Jacob. And if you remember our Saints and Outlaws series, Jacob would definitely fall within our outlaw category. See, he's a trickster who swindled his brother out of his rightful inheritance. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 28, 13 to 15. We're going to be uh, jumping around a little bit in the Genesis story tonight, so stay open to that uh, once we read this section. The story is going to start with Jacob on the run from his brother Esau. He's got to beat it because he knows that the disloyalty of his family, a family that's been chosen by God, could cost him his life. And one night, faced with this reality, he encounters God who promises Jacob that he will remain true to his promise. So if you're a note taker tonight, you're going to want to write this down. Uh, our first point is that God is loyal even when we are disloyal. Here's what the Genesis account says in Genesis 28, 13 to 15. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised for you. This is what God promises to Jacob, Jacob the trickster. And I look at this story and I get fired up. I don't think Jacob deserves this. See, he just betrayed his brother. But I think there's a critical lesson in that God's loyal love means that he is faithful to his promises, even to those who are undeserving. And here's why that's important. See, it's hard for me to accept that Jacob or anyone who I see acting carelessly uh, can be blessed. It seems like injustice to me. I know I'm not the only one who thinks that. Um, in in C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, it's a pretty interesting book, um, Lewis imagines a scenario where a man um, is talking to a friend of his uh, who is in hell. And, and this man is living in heaven. Um, but, but the man who, who is in hell is, is able to talk to an acquaintance living in heaven. And this is, this is what he says. The, the one living in heaven was a murderer back on earth. But he gave his allegiance to Jesus before he died. So his friend sees this, the friend who is in hell, and he's, he's angry. He comes, how come that kind of man is in heaven when, when he isn't? If people got what they deserved, the roles would be reversed, right? No. No. So the, the, the murderer humbly agrees, right? And this is what he says. He goes, look, I, I haven't got what I deserved, or I shouldn't be here in heaven. And this is what he says to his friend. He goes, you will not get yours either. You'll get something far better if you turn to Jesus. So here's the thing. When we turn the spotlight inward, we see our true need. By God's grace, there is a way to hand over our true rights, and that's rights to the consequences of sin, and receive an eternal gift of, of, uh, the gift of eternal life through Christ. See, here's what we all deserve. 
We all deserve death from our sin, our evil that we've done. But, but, but the, the, the reality is that, that God, in his grace, doesn't give us what we deserve. Here's what he promises us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So here's what we can do about it, friends, the fact that God's love is loyal even when we are disloyal. We can accept our need before God. See, we are disloyal. But God remains true to his promises in the midst. So, so here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop looking around at what others are doing and acknowledge that, that you have your own need before God. In doing that, you will experience the true power of God's loyal love. But God doesn't stop there. And our second point tonight, if you're a note taker, this is a good one to write down. God loves us even when we do not feel lovable. Jacob's definitely in that category. So Jacob flees from his, his brother Esau to his uncle Laban. But when God begins to bless Jacob's work with his uncle, Laban tries to cut in. And, and Jacob realizes very quickly that he isn't welcome any longer and he starts going on the run again. And now he's trapped. His uncle wants to rob him on one side. His brother wants to kill him on the other. And, and because of what he's done, not a lot of people love Jacob. And so he does the one thing that he has left. He turns to the God who has loved him even when he is unlovable. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 32. It's a couple chapters over. In verses 9 to 11, and then we're going to pick up verse 24 as well. You see it up on the screen. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan River, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. And verse 24, this is how he ends up at the end of this. So Jacob was left alone. Here's what happens. Jacob, knowing that he's ostracized, he's pushed away, everyone else in his life is left totally on his own. And he's desperate. Enough that he cries out to God, who he's barely talked to in the past 14 years. But he knows he's in need. So on his own, he feels small, he feels scared, he feels anxious, and love has not characterized his life. And there's a part of me that wonders if Jacob is realizing all of this as he walks along the shores of this river by himself. Maybe you've been there, deep in the guilt of what you've done, feeling completely alone late at night. Yet verse 24 actually continues, and if you have your Bible open, you saw this. Jacob was left alone, and here's what it says next, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So this guy comes out of nowhere, and he attacks Jacob. And the wrestling match comes to a stalemate late in the morning. And the man at the end of this asks Jacob for his name. And Jacob says, well, it's, it's Jacob. And then the man says this. Your name will no longer be called Israel. Or your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and humans. And you have overcome. Now I hear that verse and I scratch my head a little bit. Um... Because we find out later that the man that is talking to Jacob is actually God himself. And if I read that again and I see that Jacob struggled with God and overcame, that doesn't seem like it would be right. See, you're probably thinking you can't struggle with God and, and win, and, and you'd, you'd be partly right. You see, in this story, God actually kicks Jacob's butt. And, and I mean that literally. Like, he destroys his hip in one touch, if you read the story. But Jacob, now Israel, overcomes not because of his own strength against God, but because God loves him. This is an incredibly tender moment. And here's why this is important. Be 
because we will face opposition in life. And if we follow Christ, we'll oftentimes have to make decisions that leave us completely on our own, or seemingly so. But here's the thing. God's love will remain. Apart from our feelings, apart from what we think we're experiencing, the fact that God describes himself as having a loyal love means that he will hold fast in the midst of our aloneness. Check out this passage from Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 37 to 39. This is incredible. It's what the Apostle Paul says about the loyal love of God. He says, No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Not death, not life, neither angels nor demons, neither fear our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is an incredible promise. And so what can we do about it? I think there's one thing. Stand in awe of who God is and how he has loved us. My final point tonight, um, God is generous when we are empty. So Jacob comes out of his with, encounter with God, and, and he's a completely changed man. Um, his attitude is completely different. But, but beforehand in the story, we see that when Jacob is, is starting to come back to his brother Esau, um, he develops this plan where he puts his family, he puts all of his stuff out ahead, and he goes in the back. But after he meets with God, he completely changes positions. It's actually really interesting. He goes to the front of the group, and he decides that he's going to be the first one to meet his brother. Here's what happens. Um, he thinks it's going to go down. He thinks it's going to be a bad situation, but, but God has different plans for the reunion with Esau. The day doesn't end in conflict. It ends with a glorious restoration. Esau winds up being thrilled to see his brother, and he tells Jacob to keep the gifts that he had sent over to him. Jacob insists, actually, that uh, Esau, take the gifts, he goes, because here's why. He goes, these, these aren't from me. These are from the hand of God. See, Jacob winds up getting it. He's come from nothing to resounding success only by the grace of God. He's gone from emptiness to excess. And this is important for us because God is extravagant. And you can see that all around you. Scripture tells us that the whole earth is filled with God's glory. You see it in the sunrise. You see it in the laughter of children. You feel it in the coolness of the night. But the wonder of the gospel is that God doesn't just give us these gifts. He gives us himself. This is, after all, what Jesus came to give and what we most desperately need. John chapter 12, verse 24, says this in, in the message translation. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it, it, never, uh, it, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. That's Jesus talking about the picture of what his death will do. It will produce blessing for, for many because of the salvation it provides. Jesus' mission came, was to come to give us life. And when you look around and you see the beauty of creation outside in, in friends and family, you're seeing the wonder of the life, a picture and a promise of the eternal life achieved through Jesus' death and resurrection. So here's what we can do about it. We can ask ourselves the question of, do we want that today? Do we want the abundant life that Jesus has offered to us? Yahweh. God has described himself as compassionate, slow to anger, and loyal in love. He is loyal when we are disloyal. He loves us when we feel unlovable. And he is generous when we are empty. And I want to be careful not to look back on this series and to start thinking that, okay, I've got to be more compassionate. 
I've got to be more patient. I've got to be more loving. The series is about God, not you. And while those things are are good maybe for us to do, they're never going to work apart from the one who embodies them. I've heard this said before. Beholding is becoming. Beholding is becoming. A less beautiful way of saying that might be that you are what you eat. And so I have a question for you tonight. What are you consuming because the, the more that we turn to other people, the more that we turn to things like sports or, or media, Netflix, entertainment, and we look for, those, for our fulfillment in those things, the more we're going we're gonna to begin to look like what we see. And that is fickle, unstable, untrustworthy people. But the more we look at Jesus, whether that be through scripture or through spending time with him, the more we'll begin to get to resemble Jesus. So tonight, let's look to love himself, and in doing so, we will find more and more that we are able to be his image to others. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your loyal love. It is a love like nothing else that we can see. And so, Lord, when we look around, we, we see people around us who are, are fickle. They're, they're just all over the place, Lord. And the reality is we are those people. And so, God, the only way for us to get out of it is to look to you. And so that is what we choose to do tonight, Lord. We don't want to be better people. We don't want to just do the right things. Lord, we want to serve and honor and worship you because you deserve it. And so tonight I pray that as we talk in small groups, um, that you would show us more and more about who you are, and in doing so, Lord, and as we look at those things, we would become more and more like you. I pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.